Welcome again. Here is chapter six, the final chapter in your entire aerodynamics lesson. You're probably listening to this lecture before you have even taken the class. So please do not just assume that you understand everything about aerodynamics because you listen to this lecture. Please use this as a guide to help build a basic foundation so that when you get into the class, you're a little bit more well prepared so that you can increase your chances of succeeding through API. A couple of topics we're going to be discussing today in Chapter 6 are wake turbulence and wind shear. Some of the objectives that we're going to be talking about are listed in this slide. Objectives, wake turbulence, and wind shear. Terminal objectives for this aerodynamics unit, Chapter 6, are the following. From an aerodynamics perspective, Describe normal flight operations and then describe emergency flight operations. Enabling objectives for wake turbulence and wind shear in this lesson are going to be outlined in Chapter 2, TAC 6, TAC 1 of the Aerodynamics Training Guide. I ask that you please follow along as we go through these lectures so that you can ensure that when those enabling objectives come up, you can effectively efficiently and accurately depict exactly what it is that it's asking of you for those enabling objectives are where the test questions for aerodynamics 2 are found from. If you can answer those questions accurately then you can ensure that you're going to be successful as you go through this class. So wake turbulence, what is it? What causes it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Ultimately, what kind of effect is it going to have on my performance? Whether I'm in an aircraft like a T-6, whether I'm in a huge aircraft like a C-130, or whether I'm flying around in God's great chariot of death, a H-1 Whiskey Super Cobra, wake turbulence is something that can always affect you. Causes of it can occur in time an airplane is producing lift. After landing, no longer producing lift, that wake turbulence is going to be ending same wingtip vortices that cause induced drag. If you got induced drag that's being produced by your aircraft, which I would argue to be is every time that your aircraft is flying, then you can assume that you're also producing some sort of wake turbulence. Wake turbulence zone. The wake turbulence, the wingtip vortices that are coming off your aircraft, are going to have a 3 to 5 knot ground speed. That 3 to 5 knot ground speed is also going to be correlated with 400 to 500 foot per minute sink rate. The span between the two wingtip vortices, if you can imagine, is a span that occurs about the distance between the wings itself. Here's a depiction of what they actually look like as they come departing off the aircraft, showing the ground speed as well as the sink rate associated with them. I really like this video because one, it showcases an awesome aircraft, but two, it's also a study that was done, a video created by NASA. So you know that there's some validity towards it. What it's showing is what I like to look at and think of as a black vortex of death. Wingtip vortices are one of those things that we're not actually going to be able to see, unless you can see individual air particles rotating in the air, which we can't, unless you have some sort of smoke or some sort of dust debris in the air that can showcase the rotational cloud, you're not going to have that. So this video really showcases exactly how dangerous wake turbulence can be. Some strength factors in uh, the wake turbulence, vortex strength factors, are all going to be produced by certain variables. All aircraft are going to produce vortices. More heavier aircraft are going to produce more lift and therefore greater vortices. Those vortices of a faster aircraft are stretched over a longer distance and have reduced effects. As you can see in this coefficient of drag equation here, looking at induced drag, not total drag, we can see that a decrease in velocity correlates to an increase in angle of attack 
which correlates to a higher acceleration of air particles over top of the upper surface of a positively cambered airfoil, which is going to result in a larger pressure distribution, which is going to want that static air underneath the airfoil to want to go up and alleviate the low static pressure up on the upper surface of it. That is what's causing the vortexes, and those are going to be greater at slower velocities and higher angles of attack. Vortex strength with configuration. Flaps create more lift at the wing root than they do at the wing tip. Flaps reduce the velocity required in order for an aircraft to fly at level flight and allow for a lower angle of attack. If I have a lower angle of attack, I have a decrease in my induced drag production. Lower induced drag therefore uh, makes weaker wingtip vortices. Vortex size, core diameter is about a quarter of the wings aircraft's wingspan. Vortex strength is the biggest when aircraft is heavy, slow, with flaps up. Heavy, slow, flaps up. Heavy, slow, flaps up. That's when your greatest vortex strength is going to be occurring. Heavy, clean, and slow. Heavy, slow, with flaps up, whatever you want to look at. That's when the vortex sizes are going to be the greatest. Don't think wingtip vortices or wake turbulence is going to be affecting you in a T6? Think again. Induced roll, shorter wingspan aircraft may not be able to counter the induced roll caused by that. And where do you think the most uh, hazardous area is? Right in between that aircraft, in between those two wingtip vortices, more or less doubling the downwash. Wingtip vortices for helicopters. Okay, moving helicopters should be treated similar to an aircraft of similar size and weight. Stationary helicopter that's in a hover should be avoided by at least three rotor diameters. If I have a 14,500 pound aircraft and I'm in a hover, you can imagine that I'm probably producing 14,500 pounds of thrust coming down. 14,500 foot pounds of thrust is a hell of a lot of thrust and can flip your aircraft over in two seconds. Wake turbulence can move parallel to intersecting runways. It can flow if you have a crosswind that's blowing them from one side to the other. Now taking a look at wind shear. Wind shear is never one of those things that we're going to positively be looking at as a performance enhancer. However, we are going to be looking at them as positive or negative performance contributors to our flight regime. So wind shear defined. Sudden change in wind direction and or speed over a short distance. Strong wind shears are very abrupt and they can be caused by low level jet streams, wind funneling, land sea breezes, fronts, thunderstorms, just to name a few. Increasing performance land shear on landing, just as we looked at in the previous slides there, indicated airspeed increases resulting in an increase in lift and an increase in performance. Can result in high rate of descent with a very low power setting and can also be very bad.
increasing performance when you're on landing. Danger comes from making overly aggressive corrections, which could cause you to crash your aircraft. Decreasing performance wind shear on landing is the worst. Calm winds decrease indicated airspeed, resulting in decreased lift and a decrease in performance. Requires quick recognition and smooth stick and throttle inputs. Decreasing performance wind shear on landing is the worst. Dangerous when it's recognized too late and you could crash your aircraft. Some avoidance that we have to at our disposal is detection and avoidance. We got weather briefs, visual cues, AWOS, ASOS, ATIS, PIREPS, all those. Recovery techniques. One, avoid it at all costs. Do not ever go out looking for performance increasing wind shear because it's not something that we typically are going to be doing. Minimize the effects on takeoff. Use the longest runway. Use takeoff flaps. Delay the rotation by adding at least 10 knots to your takeoff speed. Climb out using that ad adjusted rotation speed and encountering wind shear prior to rotation. Abort. Abort it if possible. Wind shear procedures, once again, avoid, minimize the effects on the approach. Set flaps to take off, increase speed by 10 knots, establish power, pitch attitude, and trim by at least 1,000 feet AGL. Maintain power and higher air speeds and use pitch and trim to establish and maintain.